Hello, and welcome back from your summer break to this third IP Espresso vodcast organized by the Southeast Asia Intellectual Property SME Help Desk. Uh, do grab a coffee, sit back whilst we take a quick look at how to protect your company's intellectual property in the Southeast Asian market, and more precisely about intellectual property for young entrepreneurs uh, looking to go to Singapore. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk is a, is a project funded by the European Commission, and it's there to provide information and first-line support to small and medium enterprises about how to protect and also how to exploit your intellectual property when you're doing business in the region. Now, these services are free and confidential. Uh, they're open to all SMEs based in the European Union, but not just the European Union. We're also talking about Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and uh, since recently, also Turkey, Ukraine, and North, North Macedonia. Now, our team of IP experts are, are based in Vietnam, and what they can do is they can answer any questions you may have about intellectual property in the region. And our website has a wide collection of fact sheets and case studies about managing your IP. Now, the website address is www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Now, as I said, this is the third of our regular series of podcasts, one episode every couple of months, uh, in which we'll dive into different aspects of IP in Southeast Asia. So do follow our social media channels to find out when um, the next podcast will be. Now, this episode is kindly being produced in collaboration with the project Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs Global. Now, that's an exchange program which gives to new and aspiring European entrepreneurs the opportunity to collaborate with ex experienced entrepreneurs based in Singapore and in other countries. Um, our guest speakers uh, responsible for the project will explain step-by-step -step requirements and conditions to apply, uh, while our IP expert um, will give an overview of the IP landscape in uh, the country of Singapore. Um, we'll then wrap up the episode giving some, S uh, giving some SMEs top tips for putting in place an efficient IP strategy before entering the market. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. So Elio de Tullio uh, is in Rome and is from the network of IP experts that support the help desk. We also have Andre Almeida, who's project manager for EYE Global. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for joining me here today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah. Hi guys, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Elia, I wonder if I could just start with you. Could we just, uh, could you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your work, what you do in the region, what expertise you bring to today's panel, please? Well, thank you very much, James. So my name is Elio De Tullio. I'm the founder and managing partner of De Tullio Partners. This is an intellectual property uh, tech law firm. I'm a lawyer and trademark attorney uh, admitted uh, in uh, Italy and uh, in European Union. And uh, um, I'm also president of the uh, International Chamber of Commerce uh, um, IP Commission in Italy. And uh, uh, I'm one of the experts of the uh, Southeast Asia uh, IPR SME help desk uh, since 2015. Uh, so our aim as a, a, a tech law firm is to support uh, companies, in particular SMEs, to uh, safe export uh, uh, the goods and services uh, in uh, uh, all the world, particularly in uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so our expertise uh, comes from um, the assistance uh, to SMEs, uh, help to uh, protect their IP rights, uh, carrying out uh, uh, IP searches, uh, filing application, prosecuting application, and enforcement uh, rights uh, in uh, destination countries. Great. Thanks, Elio. Yeah, we're going to dive into a lot of that over the next uh, 45 minutes. A Andre, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, thank you so much, James. So my name is Andre Almeida. As you referred, I work for SPI, which is a partnership organization working with Horizon Europe project. My background, as it was, I, I came from China, not naturally, but I did my studies in China. So I've been living several years in China and other Asian countries. So usually inside my company, I do the projects related to this geographic area, either Southeast Asia or, or overall Asia. And therefore, I'm also managing and controlling the operations of iGlobal within SPI and other projects also. So that's pretty much a short resume of my activities here in SPI. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. And, and Andre, you're based in Porto today. Is that right? I am based in Portugal, Porto City. Yes. 
Okay. Okay. Super. Good. Just to place us all uh, as we uh, as we discuss these topics that are you know quite far away for us today, but we very much have a couple of experts of what to do in the region to protect and and exploit your your IP. Um, Andre, if I could just start with you as 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 your kind of co-sponsor of today's program, just to give a little bit more background about EYE Global and, and what it's trying to achieve. So uh, thank you again, James. We call it usually iGlobal. I think that this reference iGlobal, it's, it's easier, but definitely I stands for uh, Erasmus for Young uh, Entrepreneurs. The program is not a novelty within European Union. It's already counts with a 12 cycle at the moment and each cycle is three years. So what does iGlobal aims for? iGlobal, it's a program that wants to give an experienced entrepreneurs in Singapore the opportunity to collaborate with new entrepreneurs from EU and UK. Or we can put it on the other way around, which maybe it's better for us Europeans. Uh, so we want to give Europeans entrepreneurs, which are new entrepreneurs, the opportunity to expand their skill tools of entrepreneurship, of being successful entrepreneurs, of building a good company, the opportunity to learn the best in Singapore. And Singapore here, it's, a, it's an amazing kickstart for a person that wants to be an entrepreneur, because it's as an ecosystem, it's thriving with new ideas, it's thriving with competences, and it's thriving also as a competitive niche market. So we are trying to put our best ones of Europe to be learning with the best ones also in Singapore. So this is the main aim of the program, iGlobal. Right, thank you very much, Andre. And, and in the title, so I, sorry, I was saying you why, but so I Global, uh, in the title there's young, but I understand that you don't necessarily need to be so young. What you mean more is, is you're a young entrepreneur, as in you're a budding entrepreneur, but your age is an, an important factor. Is, is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah, that's that's true. You, you just picked a, a point here, which is not very clear within the program, because we call it new entrepreneur and not young entrepreneur, but the title has the word young. So let's try to simplify this to be without any doubt. A new entrepreneur in this program, it's a person who, it's a European Union person who firmly plans to set, set up its business or have or have less than three years of entrepreneurial business. So a new entrepreneur is it's a person without age. It can be just a, a fresh graduate person. Or... Uh, we've just, we've... I'll just interrupt you there, Andre. We just lost your microphone for a second. Just maybe see if you can tell. I'll, I'll go over to you, Elio. Um, just to, as the, the focus today is Singapore, and you're an expert on that country in particular, I wonder if you could just lay out for our audience a little bit of the, the nuances of that country compared to working with, uh, compared to working with the EU or coming from the EU. Well, um, thank you very much, James, again. Uh, following what, what you were saying about uh, uh, the age of entrepreneurs, I would, I, I would like to say that uh, I'm 56, uh, and we can say that we are all uh, differently young. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, most of the suggestions uh, I'm going to speak about uh, today are, let's say, valid for, uh, um, for um, let's say, safeguarding products and services of exporting companies all over the world. But, of course, uh, Singapore has some uh, peculiarities. Uh, Singapore is, uh, let's say, a safe place to go in terms of intellectual property, is very active at international level, is member of all the uh, international conventions uh, in intellectual property. So the Paris Convention is about the priority rights, uh, the Madrid Agreement, uh, um, the patent cooperation system. Uh, right. And so um, let's say that uh, starting from uh, uh, a protection in your country of origin, so in European Union, can allow, uh, uh, can allow you and can allow an SME, a European SME, to, um, let's say, protect their IP rights uh, uh, in Singapore uh, very easily. Um, let's say, provided that uh, all, uh, let's say, preliminary steps uh, have been carried out properly, uh, I would like to stress the preliminary searches, and I can go further in this. Then, of course, there are some differences between the um, uh, European Union system, the European Union legal framework, and Singapore. 
that uh, uh, I will focus on afterwards. Uh, but uh, um, the only thing to, to take into account is that any time uh, uh, EU entrepreneur would like to go to Singapore should start uh, thinking about the protection of intellectual property prior to the exporting in the country of destination, in Singapore indeed. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say the, the ideal um, scenario is uh, uh, some time before, I would say one year before, in order to get registrations. But of course, uh, you can also um, start a uh, you know, few weeks before, but the important is that you, your application has been correctly filed. Yeah, so I see. Yeah, this is a very important point. And this was the point that Andre was making is that Singapore is a great place to start with this because of these safeguards that are in place, because of the good relations, the good agreements already in place. It's a good country to start. Andre, if I can go back to you, can we just test your microphone again, see if it's working. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Very good. We can hear you. Fantastic. OK, um, just on that point again. So Elia was starting to go into the detail of why of the nuances of Singapore. But just before we go into that detail, which we're going to cover in a moment, I just wanted to come back to you just to say, what, why did you in particular, iGlobal pick Singapore? What were the advantages from you in terms of this exchange of, of people that appealed? Well, the reason why we picked uh, Singapore, it's, well, it's already mentioned by Elio. The ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem in Singapore, it's really a thriving one. It's full of high tech, it's very competent people, the skills are very high. Besides, it's a launching ramp for other Southeast Asia countries. And this, this is special interesting for potential European new entrepreneurs. These people, they are building a company, they definitely want to accelerate and incubate their company in Singapore. But if they want to scale up and grow the company, their business, they will definitely try to tap on the other Asian markets. So mm -hmm. as Singapore, as we know, it's about five to six million people. It's not very big and it's highly competitive. It's always good to have the possibility of Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, or even Malaysia attend, and they are really nearby. So the ones that are interesting in Singapore, they will definitely be very much interesting on the rest of the markets. And this is also the situation that we have been noticing recently with our new entrepreneurs, they are not just interested in Singapore. They want to tap Singapore because of its network, of its skills. But then when it comes to really sell the products or the service, they are looking at the other markets also. That makes a lot of sense. It's a little bit the history of Singapore itself, which was, you know, uh, very much just marshland to begin with and has developed as a hub for communication and, and commerce with, with the surrounding area. Um, I just wonder some of the practicalities, Andre. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a young entrepreneur. I'm not so young, but I'm a young entrepreneur. Let's say uh, I'm going to to want to go to the region. Uh, what? How do I do for visas, for example? Could you go through some of the practicalities that, that some of our listeners would 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 worry about as they launch on this process? Sure. Well, when it comes to visa, and because we are European Union citizens, it's actually quite easy. We don't really need to do any visa. And we enter in Singapore with a touristic visa, which goes from uh, maximum three months. And this is also the maximum duration of an exchange, business exchange, that a new entrepreneur can do in Singapore with a host entrepreneur. Maximum is three months. And it's really easy because you just go to the airport of Singapore in the customary services, you present your intentions, and you say that you come to Singapore to do some business, and they let you in with these touristic visas. So there is zero problems. And I can tell you also, this is how our new entrepreneurs operate. And this is how I operated when I went to Singapore. So it's zero concerns on this point. Very good. That's, that's, that's very reassuring for people, I think. Uh, and just in terms of the, the, the financial support that they get from the program um, and, and the logistical support on the ground, what, what shape does that take? What, what, what do they get practically? You know, what's in their welcome pack? or accommodation, uh, things like this? What, what do they have to look after and what does the program support them with? So the financial support is provided by European Commission. For the flight to Singapore going and return, you receive 800 euros. These 800 euros, it's more than enough for a round trip to Singapore. So it's no concern. If you buy a ticket for about 600 euros, you keep the other 200. And every month that you are there, and the minimum amount of time that you can be as a business exchange is one month. 
and the maximum amount is three months, for each month, you get a thousand euros. European Commission understands that a thousand euros does not allow you to live only with this money. In Singapore, you will spend more because it's a thousand euros. It's they pay accommodation, they pay transportation, and they pay food. Okay. In Singapore, yes. transportation is really cheap and food is also cheap. Accommodation is quite expensive. The goal of European Commission with this program is that is to provide a support and not a scholarship to this, not a fellowship. So you as an entrepreneur or a person that wants to be entrepreneur, you need to also support your own costs. And this is very important because we want to send the best, but we don't want to send people to go for vacation. So they need to be willing to support partially the cost of this endeavor. I understand, yes. I mean, yes, Singapore is an expensive city uh, for anyone who's visited there relatively. <laughs> So um, uh, 1,000 euros isn't going to get you very far. But as I say, you do offer this basic support just to help people get mm -hmm. off the ground. But this is an entrepreneurial program. Therefore, the hope is that you can start to, to, to develop your business and, and, and create some revenue. Um, very exactly. good. Uh, Elio, I'll, I'll just go back to you a little bit. I, I wonder if you can highlight the kind of projects that are in place to, to help SMEs um, in Singapore. What, what, what resources do they have? You started to talk about you know, make sure you, you start to register your intellectual property uh, before you go, ideally. Um, I wonder if you can provide some, you know, as I say, projects, organizations, or just tips of, of, of who to contact and how to do this. Uh, well, of course, there are some programs in European Union supporting SMEs and entrepreneurs to protect uh, intellectual property rights. Um, uh, there are also some programs uh, uh, aimed at uh, um, aimed at uh, uh, let's say scanning uh, the uh, intellectual property rights situation in SMEs, and you can refer to uh, the European Commission. The program is called IP Scan. Otherwise, uh, um, there is a UIPO, the EU Intellectual Property Office. This is that is the uh, office managing uh, uh, EU trademark and EU design that uh, uh, has launched this. Uh, um, uh, um, SME fund that uh, supports uh, SMEs uh, um, in reimbursing uh, uh, the official fees paid for patent, trademark, and design application at EU or national level. So at the end of the day, you can uh, receive uh, reimbursement up to 75% of the total amount of the official fees uh, uh, in case you file an application, a basic application in the European Union uh, that then can be, let's say, extended for the protection in Singapore or in other countries belonging to the uh, international conventions. Right, okay, that's very good to know. So there's those two, those two that you just listed there can, can be very helpful for people. Um, when you said about filing, um, you know, your intellectual property, registering your intellectual property, um, where should you do it? Sorry? Um, can you Sorry, where should you do it? Let's say I, I'm a Belgian entrepreneur, well, okay. And I want to start this process. Which country do I first get in contact with uh, to, to go through that process? Well, the best practice uh, is always to start in the country of origin right. uh, and, or in the region of origin. So uh, all preliminary searches about uh, the legal requirements for a trademark, uh, a patent or a design. Uh, so basically novelty and uh, distinctive character or individual, uh, distinctive capacity, individual character or inventive step should be carried out uh, and started in the country of origin. Then uh, from the country of, of origin, you can extend the protection in country of destinations uh, using the international conventions. So the Madrid Convention for Trademarks, the Patent, patent Cooperation Treaty for Patent or the, uh, the Hague Agreement for Design. Uh, so you have a six months priority in order to uh, make your starting date for the protection uh, um, the date of the first filing in the country of origin. So, for instance, if you file an application in, Bel in Belgium uh, today, that is uh, uh, 12 September 2023, you have time until uh, the um, 12 of uh, uh, March 2024 in order to file an, an application for a trademark. Uh, and your filing date uh, in Singapore will be the 12 of September. So it will be today. And uh, uh, you have one year priority um, for patents, uh, 
um, and uh, um, for patents and uh, uh, utility motors. But in this case, I should uh, stress the fact that in Singapore, utility motors, so petty patents, are not uh, uh, in place. So uh, you know, utility motors are in place in other countries. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting, Elio. Uh, I, we could we could go into a lot of this detail. I think a lot of our listeners will be very interested. We won't go too deep today, but I do obviously recommend that our listeners and those interested do reach out to you, do reach out to the SME help desk uh, if they have these much more technical questions about timings. But thank you very much for for starting to paint that that for us, uh, Andre. I, I'll, I'll pop back to you. We're kind of covering the detail about Singapore and in the program. I think we we just keep doing that. This try to provide a you know, as much information in the short time that we have. Uh, Andre, again, a bit more on the process of those who are uh, engaging with the with the I Global program. Um, what, what is expected of them towards the program? By that, I mean, what do they need to show you as the program organizers um, to, to get approved? And then when they're on the program, to show that they've made good use of this opportunity. Well, what, what do you demand from those uh, participants? So from the new entrepreneurs, they need to register in the iGlobal platform, which is an online platform. It's run by European Commission. While they register over there, they need to put a business plan. They need to have already either a running business plan or just a draft of a business plan. And after that, they need to contact us. They need to have interest in Singapore. If their business plan is interesting and if it matches with the suitability of our host entrepreneur, which is the experienced entrepreneur that already registered and we pre-selected and is in Singapore, then if they are willing and interested, we can uh, advance with a match. After this match, they need to prepare a commitment or activity plan. This activity plan for the time that they pre-selected to be in Singapore, which can be from one month to three months or one month and a half or two months, it will be evaluated by European Commission. So it needs to be quite well written. It needs to be precise in the type of tasks and activities they want to, de to, uh, to de develop and the skills they want to develop also. After this, they go to Singapore, and in Singapore, we actually let them run as they want. Of course, we also monitor a little bit, but we are not every week doing that. We have the host entrepreneur with whom we contact closely to understand how the business exchange is doing. When it finishes, a report is necessary. But most mm. of all, European Commission understands how it's going to be, because, well, first of all, we already selected the new entrepreneur. We understand the, seri the seriousness of the, their exchange, the intentions. So when they are in Singapore, we let them work the way they want. And it often happens that it goes extremely well to the point that they can expand their business. Mm -hmm. Right, I see. Thank you for that. Um, I just seen, we were going to do questions, Q and A's at the end, but I see that a question's just popped in, which is very relevant. So Andrew, I'll just pass pass on this question to you from uh, Shinedum. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, but she asks, or he asks again, I'm, I'm not sure, but how do we know what host organizations are there on the platform? Um, and she asks this because she'd like to know how best to draft the documents that you just explained. I wonder well, if you could- Sure. When you enter in the platform after being registered as a new entrepreneur, you can search for the host entrepreneurs which are available. And we are often registering new host entrepreneurs. By You can check their profile, understand what's their company, what's their business, what's their sector, and what they search in a new entrepreneur. Considering this, you can obviously draft your activity plan, and also you can write a message or email di directly to that host entrepreneur, inviting him for a match. So, and you can after contact SPI saying, look, I contacted this host entrepreneur, I'm interested in this relation, and I would have time on this moment and this moment. Are you guys in agree? Can we advance? And we obviously, we will try to run with a possible uh, match that if it's suitable also for the host entrepreneur. Mm. Great. I, I hope that's answered the question. If not, do put in a, a follow-up question into the chat and we'll, we'll address that at the, uh, at the uh, close of the show. 
Uh, Elio, back to you, please. Um, uh, given your, your your vast experience uh, in in the region, I just wonder whether you could flag some of the the potential problems that you can encounter, and perhaps you know, without naming names, give us an idea of the kind of issues that people have faced in the past when they've tried to kick off their their business, their their expansion into Southeast Asia via Singapore. Well, um, thank you. First of all. Uh... Uh, one of the main problems is that uh, the uh, right uh, uh, filed, uh, the right uh, filed by the, um, the the SMEs, the EU SMEs, are not, uh, let's say, enough strong to be then used on the market, even with licensees uh, or with distributors uh, or with agents. So right. uh, the the first tip is uh, uh, please carry out preliminary search in order to check the legal requirements uh, and to file uh, strong rights, to file strong trademarks, strong patents, strong designs. And the use, of course, title rights rather than untitled rights. So title rights are indeed uh, trademarks, patents, and designs. If we go, if we switch to know-how, for instance, uh, the burdens, the, the, let's say, the frames of uh, know-how are a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, uh, weaker. Mm -hmm. um, and second is to um, uh, to enter into uh, non-disclosure agreements, uh, so um, agreements with the counterparty, with the distributors, with the uh, provider, with the partner, uh, in written, identifying specifically all uh, intellectual property rights uh, and try to, let's say, make them uh, as, uh, uh, as more precise as possible. Uh, sometimes uh, in uh, Southeast Asian countries, it also it is also common to use, uh, let's say, uh, upgrades of uh, NDAs that are called uh, NNN, non-disclosure, uh, non-use, non-circumvention. That are agreements, uh, let's say, wider agreements that can cover also the circumvention of the agreements uh, by the uh, by the other party. But of course, uh, a good IP strategy. Uh, should be uh, should uh, receive a holistic approach. So um, mm -hmm. once you have, uh, let's say, uh, your business plan, you should include uh, intellectual property in your business plan. You you should allocate resources in order to file, to register, to enforce your rights, and then uh, to let's say uh, draft prop agreements to exploit your rights in the country. And then uh, you will. Uh, use this uh, this budget in order to uh, let's say put in place all the needed um, ip um, rights uh, actions uh, uh, in order to avoid problems uh, mm -hmm. so what is uh, very common is uh, is that uh, the distributor uh, um, in the place uh, in the in singapore starts using your ip rights without permission mm -hmm. uh, or uh, start to uh, promote uh, uh, its own business uh, using for instance uh, the transliteration in Chinese or in other um, uh, Southeast Asian languages in the country, or they can use this, uh, uh, you know, the Singapore hub to go to uh, other Southeast Asian countries to do the same. Um, so, and this uh, is always a consequence of uh, the uh, uh, under evaluation, underestimation of potential problems. So everything can be done starting from European Union. Uh, also the extension of the protection in Singapore can be done from European Union. And uh, so you can, uh, uh, the, the uh, ideal world is that uh, uh, you can start any protection uh, before uh, going to the market. Mm. Very interesting, yeah, and, and, and quite concerning. I think you, you highlighted here how, how easy, if you don't do your homework, you don't prepare carefully enough, you can, you can get into some quite serious problems. If, if you were to get it, can yeah, I go ahead, Adia, please. Um, so uh, the point is, uh, uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, try to uh, register your right instead of using your right, because in the European Union, there is also the possibility to, let's say, receive protection if you only use rights. But in Singapore, the first to file system is, uh, is the king. So you need to, mm -hmm. to observe this, uh, this principle. And the other, notify to the public the existence of these IP rights. So use the, the, the circle capital C for copyrights or the number of patents for uh, the, the registration of uh, the patent or uh, the same for the TM for trademark or the, 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 the circle. Uh, what do you mean, Elio? R. Sorry to interrupt. You mean just make that visible on, on, yeah, on your communication? Just make that very yeah. present. On your website, on your promotional material, and mm. uh, uh, let's say notify to the public that there is an IP right 
So uh, um, this can also uh, be a good, let's say, starting point in case you would like to uh, request a compensation for damages, for instance. I understand. So you can, you've can you got the paper trail, if you like, to then be able to point precisely to where the abuse or the, the infringement yeah. has, has, has taken place. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, very good advice. Um, Andre, just back to you then. Also, just to, to talk about some of the problems that participants in the program might encounter or, or what, you know, some tips on what they should do to make the most of such an opportunity. What, what, what should they get? What should they do upon arrival? You know, and, and what should they really focus on while they're there? Apart from obviously just trying to become an entrepreneur and making money and, and protecting their property. Uh, I mean, what else tips could you give? Well, that's, that's uh, it's important part of making money. That's, I would say, that's the reason why they go. Well, yeah. uh, we usually say to our new entrepreneurs that one of the most important things that they can and they should be doing while in Singapore, it's networking. Even if it's not really totally uh, connected with their business, they should be doing networking. The program, it's... It's an exchange program. It's a networking program. It aims for people from Europe to connect to a different part of the world. Many Europeans didn't went to Southeast Asia. Many didn't went to uh, Singapore. They know many of us Europeans know very little about this part of the world. So that to be able to enter in several events, to do a lot of networking, to connect with people, these will advance their uh, business, not only on short term, but also on long term. It provides them a security and opportunity to do more in the future. Of course, that when it comes to Singapore, these are the main tips that we, we give them, considering that it's a business uh, program. When it comes to challenges, and we need to also to address the challenges, and we started this conversation uh, actually talking about one of these challenges, which is accommodation. Uh, Singapore is an expensive city, country, nation, and accommodation is really difficult and expensive. So we provide uh, some services uh, regarding that. One of the people that works with us in the program is actually a Singaporean person. We also have a local contact person, uh, which is an organization, Coventry University, which also works with us in uh, iGlobal to provide some services. Besides, we have several host entrepreneurs which have their own network of resources and can provide also several solutions and information to surpass this challenge, which is often to find a, a proper accommodation for Singapore. And it can be less easy if you just go to Singapore, for example, one month or one and a half or two months. Mm -hmm. Besides that, the program is running very well. And what we felt from our new entrepreneurs is that once you arrive there, it's very easy to accommodate and to adapt to the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that's a very optimistic note, as I say. I think <clears throat> Singapore is a very interesting country, particularly for entrepreneurship. So I think that uh, it, it's a great country to, to, to develop such a program around. Um, uh, I have a few questions from the audience to, to bring up in a moment. Just one last question from me, Elio, to you. Um, I wonder if you could just describe a little bit, because we talked about, you know, the way that Singapore can be a base, a base to Malaysia, a base potentially to Indonesia. You know, there's a lot of, there's, you know, millions of billions of people in that, that part of the world. So I just wonder whether you could just point to some of the nuances about the differences between some of these countries, uh, given Singapore's proximity, for example, to Malaysia. Well, uh, thank you. Mm, well, uh, on this purpose, uh, I would, uh, well, it would be not easy to summarize all the differences between Singapore and uh, the other Southeast Asian countries. There are several differences, and I would say that uh, um, um, Singapore is on the top tier in terms of uh, protection of intellectual property rights, uh, because it's very active and it is member of all international, basically all international conventions. So let's say it's easier to protect IP rights in Singapore. There is also protection according to the total law passing off in terms of uh, uh, anti-competition, um, let's say, activities. Uh, there are, there is, a, for instance, the, uh, there is a, uh, the possibility to, um, to obtain uh, an accelerated program 
uh, from IPOS, from the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore, in case uh, you file an application, you would like to speed up your uh, registration process. So there are a lot of opportunities in Singapore. In the other country, it's not the same. Um, in, and and the, moreover, in Singapore, you, need the, uh, you, you, you can use English as official language of mm -hmm. any application uh, and registration process. This is not the case in other countries, for instance, Malaysia. Um, and uh, also, let's say, the enforcement of IP rights can be a little bit uh, more complicated in these countries. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, some of these countries are not members of international convention, so you cannot start the protection of the European Union and extend in these countries, but you need to, uh, let's say, go uh, with national files. Okay, thank you, Elio. That's, uh, that's interesting. As, as I say, I think that this is a... There's a lot of information needed here to really, you know, expand into all of those countries across the region. Uh, but but useful just to give a, a sense that Singapore is probably the easiest. It's, it's the great entry point for this. And then there's a lot more homework and a lot more preparation to be done if you look to then expand geographically further out. Uh, and another question for you earlier, from, from this time from the audience. But so what are the main differences in the IP system between Singapore and the European Union? If you could just in a couple of minutes lay that out for me. Well, thank you. Very interesting question. Uh, there are several differences, um, let's say, uh, basically related to formalities. Uh, so first of all, uh, in Europe, you can protect, for instance, the design, so the appearance of the, uh, of the product, the aesthetic part of the products. Uh, uh, also, in case they are not registered, you have uh, uh, provided for the EU law, you have uh, uh, three years protection for unregistered design. This is not the case in uh, Singapore, where uh, you need to file an application and to get a registration. Uh, the, registr the duration of the registration is, is five years and can be renewed for a maximum of three times for a total amount of 15 years. Uh, right. In Europe, uh, this duration is 25 years. So this is also a big uh, a difference uh, between the EU system and the Singapore system. Then in Singapore, there is no copyright office. There is no copyright registration. So you need to only, let's say, notify to the public that you have a copyright, the date of starting uh, of the publication or the starting of the protection, and uh, that you are the author, the basic author. And uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, enough to reverse the burden of proof. Uh, in uh, Italy, European Union, and other countries, it is adv advisable to file an application before the competent copyright office. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then the other, um, uh, the other difference is uh, uh, the one I highlighted before. Uh, so in uh, um, Singapore, there's no protection for uh, utility patents. So these small patents, uh, these, let's say, patents with a low degree of inventiveness. Uh, and so uh, this is, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, a kind of right that, is, uh, that can be protected in the in, uh, European Union. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andre, a question to you that's come in. Uh, so is there a way to view the registered host entrepreneurs in Singapore? You touched upon this a little bit before uh, to actively propose uh, a business exchange. So it, thereby potentially making the process faster to find a, a partner. What, what, what do you think? Is, is that possible? Uh, yes, James, that is possible. Once mm. the new entrepreneur registered and is in the platform, he can visualize all the host entrepreneurs and he can actively propose a relation, a matchmaking relation with any host entrepreneur. Actually, and I can tell you also this, uh, one new entrepreneur can propose a relation with several host entrepreneurs. He can, if he sees three host entrepreneurs that he likes, he can go to the platform and propose a matchmaking relation with three of them. Of course, in the end, right. he will only have it with one of them, but he can call to the attention of these three host entrepreneurs. It's, and he can send an email to three of them. In the end, what we do from our side is to have a call with this new entrepreneur to understand what is his preference, and then have a call with the host entrepreneur to see if the host entrepreneur is in agree. And we have a common call together, joint call, to see if there is a good match between both parts, means new entrepreneur and host entrepreneur. If they both accept, the match is closed, it's established a relationship, 
and then we advance with the normal formalities of writing an activity plan and then mm -hmm. preparing the uh, the financial support for the new entrepreneur to go to Singapore. I see. So, and and I guess yeah, the, the person who does contact or identify three potential partners and reaches out to them, that's that's doing that networking that you were saying was so crucial. It's just about yeah. starting to reach out to the wider community and not just being you know reliant on one one partner, which uh, yeah, as you said, is is is, is part of the, the the goal of the program. Exactly, and this is how we prefer. We prefer a new entrepreneur that is active, actively promoting his positioning, a uh, new entrepreneur that is entering in contact with the host entrepreneur, and this uh, new entrepreneur gives us the confidence and the trust that when he is in Singapore, he will be networking. And to facilitate this, we also put in contact with this new entrepreneur the other host entrepreneurs, which are uh, having business in different uh, sectors, but can be opportunities of future. So we mm. also work on this and we also have a much larger networking in Singapore, which we can always tap to be a support for this new entrepreneur. But definitely you are very much right on that. We like and prefer proactive new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And a kind of follow-up question to that, Andre. Um, if you can't find precisely, let's say you're a very niche business with a very specific interest, you can't find exactly the right match. Does the program allow you to go kind of close to your area of expertise? Does it allow you to, to find something that, you know, face to face doesn't match exactly, but there is the potential there to find common ground in the future, maybe? Yeah, it has to allow because we have some businesses which are very, very specific. We had a while ago a business of an uh, of, uh, individual who did uh, satellites for space. Uh, space right, yes, there's not many companies doing so, that, yes. <laughs> there is not many companies in Singapore doing that. There is not mm -hmm. many in Europe doing that. So when you find a person like this, what you try to build on, it's on complementarities. Mm -hmm. And you will not find that precise business, but you might find other host entrepreneur which has a very interesting business and run a set of skills which is interesting on pushing that one because it's interesting also in Europe and it's also interesting in that specific business. So we build on these complementarities and we establish the relationship from there. Very good. Um, we're coming up to the end, gentlemen. So I, I, we're going to start closing up there. I, I'm just going to uh, lead out with Nacho, but I just wanted to say thank you very much both for your time today. It's been very interesting. I hope our, our audience has got a lot of answers to the questions they maybe had. Obviously, we we invite them to to reach out to you both. You know, your organizations have both been mentioned. They can find this information online. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, just finish up today's meeting. Um, so uh, as we come to the end of today's podcast, I just want to say a massive thanks to you both today uh, and to the audience for joining us. Um, if you missed any of this podcast, we will be posting it shortly onto our YouTube channel. Uh, and that is on our IP Espresso channel. So do go there. Uh, if you want more information generally on how to protect your innovations in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, uh, then please do go to our website that I mentioned at the start. I'll just lay that out again to you. It's www sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Um, you can submit your questions to our IP experts based in Southeast Asia. And also on that website, you can download lots of fact sheets about intellectual property in the region. Um, finally, we would love to know what you thought about this podcast. Uh, in the closing titles, there'll be a QR code that will appear. It's our feedback survey. And we'd be very grateful if you could take a few minutes to share your views so that we can look to improve this uh, as we move forward. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your coffee time with us today. Our next episode will be uh, broadcast in November, I believe, uh, and that will be announced on all of our social media channels. So once again, thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much, Elio. And uh, see you next time. <laughs>